So we're going to kick off a series this week called Body Building. And for those of you, yes, that is my arm. I did allow them to take a picture of my arm and flexing. I kind of hide it in my shirts on Sundays. You know, I don't, don't try not to wear anything too tight fitting or anything like that. But we're going to talk about bodybuilding. And when you think about somebody who is a bodybuilder, this is somebody who has dedicated a, a large part of their time, a, a lot of effort into developing a body, into building muscle. Uh, bodybuilders are people who, they, they eat right. You, you know, ain't that right, Pastor Jimmy? We have to eat right to look like this. I mean, like, we got to eat right. We got to work out, put a lot of hours in every day into the gym you know, there, there's some grit and determination, some hard work, some soreness and stuff that goes along with being this huge. You know, it, it, it's just, it's, it's a tough road to do, but, but we do it, you know, for a purpose. We do it for, for strength and, you know, bodybuilders have to be aware of, of all kinds of things or, or uh, like they have to target all kinds of different muscle groups. They have to target it from different angles. They, uh, otherwise, they can look like really weird. Have you ever seen anybody who like they're, they're all huge and, and, you know, big chest, big arms, but then their legs are like little tiny bird legs and they, they, they just kind of look misproportioned. They, they, they don't, it doesn't look right. And, and so when, when you lift weights or a body builders lifting weights especially if they compete like they they've got to do it and and be very targeted they they got to be very intentional about their eating habits the way they work out the the you know the taking in enough water supplements all of those things because they want to make sure that the body can perform and and get the results that it wants and, and Jesus is the same way with his church. He's very intentional about building his church and, and his body. The Bible talks about how we are the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, it says, just as the body is one, but there are many members, and all of its members are part of the body. Though they are many, they are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit... We were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. And so when you look at this, like this is, this is something that, uh, that, that is, is not God pleasing the way that his body has kind of divided himself, them, themselves. Here it says whether Jew or Greek, whether you're, you're, you're a slave or a free person, it, you're, you're still part of one body. You know, the way that looks for us today is whether you're Baptist or Church of God or Assembly of God or, or Methodist or non-denominational or whatever, we are still part of one body. And within a church, whether you're young or old, you're black or white or Hispanic or, or, or Asian or, or whatever ethnicity you may be, we are all still part of one body. You know, in the church world today, you, there's a lot of times we, we, we talk about the, the church as being the, the family of God. And, and you know, there, is, there are some scriptures that talks about brotherhood and, and, and you know, that type of thing. But, but it, the, when, when you think about this, like a family, in, in families, there, there's, families can, can split. Families can eventually, you know, kids grow up and they move out and they, they have their own families and they, they can move out of state or, you know, I've got a family member that's in Kosovo right now on the other side of the world and, and everything. And, and, and even though we're family, like there, there's this distance and there can be division, you know, in, in, in family, there can be some dysfunction. Come on, we have anybody that's got a little crazy people in their family. Come on, y'all know it. And if you say you don't, you are the crazy person. Like Everybody else knows you're the crazy one in the family. Like family, you can, you can believe, be blood relatives and never have a conversation again for the rest of your life. You can be blood relatives and, and have complete disconnection and, and things that take place. You can, you, you can be married and... 
and, and you see so many marriages just end in divorce and things and, and how that can rip apart a family. But a body, however, like my head can't just rip off and decide it, it wants to do its own thing. My arm can't just take off and try to do its own thing, you know. My, my lungs can't be like, nah, I, I, I don't like this guy anymore. Sometimes he works out and makes me have to work too hard. I'm going over here, you know, that, that type of thing. You know, like a body has to stay together. Parts of your body can't just go rogue. They can't disconnect. If, if there's a part of your body that is injured or a part of your body that is hurt, then it affects the entire body. And Paul talks about that in, in verse 26 of chapter 12. He says, if one member suffers, then we all suffer together. And if one member is honored, then we all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ. And you are individually members of it. Now when you think about this, if we are the body of Christ, and we have dysfunction in the body of Christ, then how healthy is the body going to be? In the majority of churches, about 90% of what takes place ministry-wise takes place by about 10% of the people and then the other 90% of the people come and just hear and, you know, consume and go on about their day. Now let me ask you this question. If 90% of your body is not functional, are you healthy? Doc Johnson, you're a doctor. Are you healthy if 90% of your body? No. You're not. You're basically on life support. You're basically a, a vegetable at that point if only 10% of your body is functioning. And so it's no wonder that it seems like the body of Christ loses all these battles because there's still so many parts of the body who have not found their part and begin to function in their role as part of the body. The choice to not be active doesn't just affect you, it affects the entire body. The choice to not be healthy doesn't just affect you, it affects the whole body. I think about this uh, a few years back, it was, it was right after Chanan was born, we had tried to kind of do like a little overnight trip with our kids and we just went up to Charleston and, and uh, just stayed at the embassy suites up there because they got like the, the, the little stuff that, that you can go down in the lobby and they got snacks and food and stuff that you can do and you got the mall there and we went to movies and just kind of hung around, we just wanted to do something, just kind of change of scenery and stuff for our kids and, and so we're there about two days and, and you know we go to the movies and I start having this pain in my stomach the first day and it really started hurting and, and then it started intensifying over a period of time and, and, and like I'm, I'm trying to play with the kids in the pool and, and how many of you dads know you can't just get in the pool with the kids like that, that's not how it works if you're in the pool with the kids they're climbing on your head they're, they're all over you and stuff and, and then of course you got to throw them around and everything and, and so I'm like I'm sitting here and I'm throwing them and as I throw them I'm like oh my gosh like just horrible pain and and, and you're just kind of going through the whole thing and stuff and and I grab Melody's phone and I I'm like let me see your phone real quick and I'm like googling like what is symptoms of appendicitis you know all this stuff like because I am hurting and, and, and struggling but I don't want to ruin the family trip you know and so I'm just kind of pressing in and and doing stuff and then finally after this I, I went and I called my doctor and I was like hey 
you know, I'm, I'm having a lot of pain, having some of these symptoms. You know, how would I need, know if I, if I could, uh, if, I, if I need to go to a hospital and kind of get that checked and, and, and think I might be having appendicitis or something? And he said, well, Brandon, if you, can, if you can stand and you can do all this stuff like that, like you're not having like a major, like you would know, you'd be like doubled over in pain. And I'm thinking, well, I was just throwing my kids around in the pool for like an hour, so surely I'm good. I'm, I'm going to be fine. And, and so I go to bed that night and I'm still hurting. I'm not feeling good. And my son comes and he climbs into bed with me and he touches my side and I about threw him out the bed. Like I, I'm like in extreme pain and Melody had just had Chanin. This is like three weeks after we had just had Chanin. And, and, and so, uh, and she had got out of the hospital because Chanin was in Huntington for a, a week and had been air med and all this. And so we were just trying to have some family time and everything. And so I go over to Melody, I tap her on the shoulder. I'm like, hey, I'm going to the hospital. <laughs> and she's like, what? Like, because I don't just go to a doctor for no reason. She thought, like, he has to be dying. And so I get to the ER, and I, and I walk in, and, and I'm like, hey, you know, having stomach pain. I start filling out the paperwork and everything. And, and the lady's like, okay, just go sit over there. You know, there's all kinds of people in, in the ER and, uh, and all that. And uh, so then, uh, like, I'm filling out the paperwork. I'm hurt, and I'm filling out the paperwork and stuff. And then all of a sudden, like, I just start vomiting all over the place. Like, just, and like, almost passing out and all this stuff. So, and, and they took me immediately back as soon as that all started happening. So information, if you are in pain and, and in the hospital and you want to get bumped ahead in the ER wait list, just start throwing up all over the place. They'll take care of you after that. You know, and get back and they, they do the ultrasound and my appendix is about at the point of rupturing and, and everything. And luckily, God in was able to do the surgery and everything. But that one little part of the body that nobody even knows what it does. Nobody thinks about their appendix. Nobody works out for their appendix. They're not like, they, they don't go around and be like, hey, look at the appendix on that one. You know what I mean? Hey. Check out her appendix, you know what I mean? It just doesn't happen. But you let that one little part not function properly. And they, they, it put my whole body to sleep. They do the surgery. I get up, my whole stomach's hurting. Like the, the, it, it affected everything in me. And had I been probably just a few minutes later, because they rushed me in for emergency surgery, had I been just a few minutes later and that thing ruptured and all that spreads throughout the entire body, like it's a way worse story that I'm telling you. And so many times we allow the devil to convince us that, oh, I'm just a cameraman. It doesn't matter. I'm just an usher. I'm just opening a door. I'm just working a parking lot. All I'm doing is cooking food in a food truck. All I'm doing is holding a baby in the nursery. All I'm, that doesn't really matter. But it does. It affects the whole body. Like our decision when we decide not to feed ourselves spiritually, it affects the whole body. When we decide to disconnect from prayer, it affects the whole body. Because as our part begins to get unhealthy, then it begins to affect our, and, and God forbid that our part get offended and never really deal with it and try to solve that because that offense is like, it's, it's like septic. It begins to spread and just go throughout. We have to realize and not allow the enemy to deceive us into thinking that our part of the body is not important. Another problem that you have in the body is when the body fights against itself. You know, when Zia was young, they used to do a blood test and they would, they would check for her ANA. And ANA is an anti-nuclear antibody. And, and that's a, it's a protein that when you have that in your body, it's showing that your body is creating proteins that's fighting against itself. 
And it's fighting against, uh, it can be organs or it can be different things. And, and that's, that's how you get these different autoimmune diseases like lupus and Sjogren's and, and, and rheumatoid arthritis and all these things is, is when you have an ANA that begins to, to fight against, uh, your, part of your body begins to fight against things because it sees it as like an outside threat or, or, or as, as something that's different. And, and we have that issue in the church world today as well where People of different denominations are just you can't even unite and, and do things together. There, it, it's crazy because there's certain schools that we can't play in basketball because we have different doctrinal beliefs on things that don't portray to salvation at all. They'll go play a public school, but they won't play us. Now tell me how that makes any sense. But the body is divided in that way that the ANA is, a, is an indicator of an autoimmune issue, an autoimmune disease, and we see that throughout the church. And guys, it's not God's desire that we should be divided. In fact, Jesus' last prayer, and the, the only prayer that Jesus ever prayed that has yet to be answered. And the reason why I say has yet to be answered is because it's going to be answered one day. Because whether we want to accept it or not, God is not a polygamist. He is coming back for a bride of Christ, not brides of Christ. He's not going to have a Baptist bride and a Pentecostal bride and a, and, and a, and a Methodist bride and, a, and, a, and an apostolic bride and, and all of those things. He's coming back for one bride, one body. And in John 17, in front of his disciples and everybody, he's praying and he says, I do not... Ask on behalf of these only. Talking about the disciples that were in the room. This is at the Last Supper. He's saying, I'm not just praying about these 12 guys that are in the room. Or actually, this time, it's 11 guys that are in the room because Judas had already gone. He says, but I pray this for all who will believe in me through their word. How do we know about what Jesus did at the cross? Through the word of the disciples. They wrote it out. It became scripture, and that's how we know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's saying, this is my prayer for all of us who are believers. Not any individual sects or anything, but all who will believe in me because of the word that these disciples write. That they all would be one just as you, the Father, are in me and I am in you. That they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Do you see why it is so important that there is unity in the body of Christ? He said the very thing that's going to make the world believe that Jesus actually came to the world and was sent by the Father and died on a cross so that the people could be saved is that there would be unity among the body. Now, if this is the difference in between, our, that, what essentially this means is our disunity is causing people to not come to Jesus and not believe in Jesus. And so if this is the difference in between somebody's eternity, don't you think we need to do what we need to do to, to bridge across uh, uh, barriers and stuff to be unified as the body of Christ? And I'm not just talking about other churches. Because we can have this unity right here in our own body. And this is why we talk about the way to have Biblical reconciliation is to go and talk to that individual first. And then if they don't respond, then go with somebody and talk to that individual. And then if they don't respond after that, then bring, it, bring a church leader with you to go and talk to that. But too many times, we don't talk to that individual first. We talk about that individual, but we don't talk to that individual. And everybody else knows the problem that we have with that individual, but that person is never even, they're out, they're clueless that anything has ever happened. You're like, well, pastor, they should know. If they did it to me, they should know. Guys, 
There are things that we do unintentionally all the time that we have no idea that it hurts somebody else. There are ways that, that like, that I can talk, I, like, my, even within my kids, I can talk to one of my kids one way, and there's no way that I could ever talk to my other kid that way because it would crush them if I talked to them that way. And I have to know, that I, and I had to realize that there were things that I was doing that were just part of my personality. My, it's just who I am. I'm just a straight shooter. I'm just blunt. I'll just tell it like it is. And I had to realize that sometimes I was just being a jerk. And if for some people, that approach was not going to bring forth any benefit, any type of reconciliation, it was only going to bring a hurt. And I could just go on and be like, well, they need to get over it. They're just being too sensitive. Or I can realize that part of what God put on me is to be a part of the body of Christ that pursues uh, uh, unity and pursues wholeness and healing. That's why he said, if you're at the, at, at the altar, in Matthew 5, he said, if you're at the altar presenting your gift and you realize that somebody has something against you, go be reconciled. But then he also says that if you were the person who offended someone else, go be reconciled. Either way, whichever side of the coin is, he tells both sides, the offender and the offendee, you need to go be reconciled in hope that someone will take the first step and go allow unity to take place. I tell my kids all the time when they're fighting, and they'll be like, well, they did this and they did this. And I'm like, at some point, you have to realize that either one of you could stop this fight right now. Either you could allow them to have what they want, or you could just be quiet and stop talking about it. Either one, if one of you would be mature, this thing would be over. And we wouldn't be listening to this same fight over and over and over. There is a point where for the sake of the body, Somebody has to say, I'm going to preserve and fight for unity because I realize that the world is watching and the fact that there's disunity is turning them off from Jesus instead of attracting them to Jesus. He goes on and he says, the glory that has been given to me, I've given to them. So that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, and you and me. Uh, that we may be, they may be perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them. Even as you have loved me. Just before this, in John 13, he says, The way that people are going to know you're truly my disciples is your love for one another. That you care about others. That you love each other. We can't be people who rejoice when other people fail. The, it, it, remember what it said in verse 26. It said, if one member suffers, we all suffer. If one person is honored, we, we all honor. We've got to stop rejoicing when other people suffer. And stop, and stop being jealous when someone else is honored. Because we have to realize this thing is not about any one of us as individuals. Each one of us as individuals are part of a body. And we don't want to be guilty of being the one that's unhealthy, that affects and brings pain to the entire body. And we don't want to be the part that is fighting against the body within ourselves. Whether it's the corporate body or the local body we have to stop allowing the devil to divide us on our differences and instead we have to to unite under the banner which is the name that is above every name the banner of Jesus and as we prepare ourselves to go into Easter week like this is a perfect time to realize 
That, that what separates us from the world, what makes us different is because we have seen love demonstrated at a cross where someone selflessly laid down their lives for others, where someone was willing to take the fault, willing to take the blame, willing to take whatever and be punished and mocked and humiliated and go to a cross so that we didn't have to be punished. This week is known as Passion Week. When you think about passion, you, you, it, it's not just a strong feeling of emotion. But when you go and you, you begin to research this, the, the word passion comes from a Latin word, passio. And the word passio literally means this. It means to endure suffering. So yes, Jesus was passionate about the people. That's why he was willing, but his passion led him to be willing to endure suffering. And he demonstrated his passion as he approached the cross. In Luke chapter 9, it says that as it came time for him to draw near, uh, that he, uh, and he was getting ready to ascend into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Some translations put it that he set his eyes toward Jerusalem like a flint. He was determined. He had intentionality he was fully focused that what I'm going to do even though it's going to mean that I'm going to endure suffering even though it's going to mean that it's going to cost me my comfort even though I didn't even do anything wrong I am willing and I love people enough and I'm passionate enough that I'm willing to bear a cross I'm willing to be mocked I'm willing to be beaten I'm willing to be humiliated I'm willing to be stripped naked have my beard plucked out to demonstrate love because I want my church, I want my people to be able to join around this moment right here because this is what makes the difference in between heaven and hell. It's not your denomination. It's not whether you believe in women in ministry. It's not your beliefs on the Holy Spirit. It's none of those things. It's do you believe in the cross and what Jesus did and how he rose from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father. That is what matters. And all of the other little differences don't matter at all. If it doesn't matter in between heaven or hell, it is not something we should be divided on. And I'm not just talking about doctrinally in the church as a whole. It, when it comes to little things in between people that they disagree on methodology or different things like that, it shouldn't be something that we're willing to divide the body on. People's eternities are weighing in the balance of us understanding the love that was demonstrated and the passion that was demonstrated to us through the cross and laying aside ourselves. And if we have to suffer, we suffer. But we suffer for the body so that other people might be saved. And there's so many people that are just perfectly content to just come and receive and walk out. Not realizing that overall that's hurting the body. When you go around and you say, I am a Christian, I'm a believer, but you show no passion for the things of God. You have no desire for his word. You have no desire for the people that he loves. You have no desire to serve. You have no desire for any of those things. Then what you are showing to the world is there's not much difference in between me and you except you say you're a Christian and I get to sleep in on Sundays. If they can't, if we have to tell them they're, that we're a Christian, there's a problem. If they can't see our love, 
for God and they can't see our love for people, there's a problem. Because Jesus said the sign of a true disciple is that you love one another. And I think anybody who is around me and Melody for any point in time can look at us and be like, they love each other. Because it, it, it just comes out. It's not forced. I don't have to muster up anything to serve her. I don't have to be motivated and have the worship just right and the lights just right and the environment just right and the temperature and everybody else in the room being connected and, and all that stuff. Like, that's, that's what we've done in the church is we've created people that can go into a room like this and if nobody else is raising their hands, then I can't raise my hands. I don't want to be the one who's weird. If nobody else is clapping their hand, I don't want to be the one who claps. If nobody else is engaging in active worship, then I don't want to set that precedence. And you know what it does? It sets a precedence for the young people who come behind us that they don't have to be passionate about Jesus either. Because I can tell you this, when everything was taking place in the school, all the kids are all passionate. They're going crazy and fired up and dancing and everything. And then when they come to church on Sunday, they don't feel like they can. Same way that passion is contagious, a lack of passion is contagious too. whether the person beside me is raising their hands and singing and worshiping Jesus or not, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus went to the cross for me and that I was a messed up person and now I'm just a slightly less messed up person that God is still working on. People should see our love for God. Like, and I'm not saying this in a rebuking way. I'm just asking a question here. When was the last time that you were brought to tears praying for someone who is lost? And some of you may be like, well, I prayed for my boy like that. I'm praying, I'm believing for my... When was the last time that you prayed you were brought to tears praying for someone who's lost who's not in your family. Well, I'm just not an emotional person. If we truly understood hell and heaven, it should trigger some emotions. Because even our worst enemy we shouldn't want to go through the torture and the punishment that hell is going to be. There are people who are supposed to be a part of the body of Christ who are not part of the body of Christ now because they're waiting on the body of Christ to be the body of Christ. And I love this. Jesus didn't let anything distract him or deter him from the cross. We know all the parts about him being beaten and mocked and, you know, he can't even carry his own cross and he's whipped and all this stuff. We, we know those parts of the story and, and all that as, as he's going. But you know what else he didn't allow to keep him from the cross? The praises and accolades of man. Because they call this Palm Sunday because when he entered into Jerusalem on that cult, they were throwing down their coats and they were throwing down their palm branches and they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, the son of David. And they were lifting him up and they were praising him and they were glorifying him and, and they were all happy because their Messiah was coming. 
And for many of us and many people in the church world today, they're perfectly content because if people are just praising me and lifting me up, then I'm going to stay right here because it's comfortable. It's convenient. But Jesus didn't allow him. He didn't allow comfort and convenience to keep him from embracing the cross. Even when he was so stressed out that he is sweating blood. Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. But nevertheless, God, not my will but yours be done. And he embraced the cross. Why? For us. Because it was the only way that his body would be healthy. It was the only way that his body would be able to be restored to God. And there are people who are waiting for us to get out of our comfort and convenience and embrace our cross and have passion and love for our Savior and for the lost. And if I have to suffer so someone else can be saved, then I'm going to suffer. If I have to be inconvenienced for someone else to find Jesus, then let me be inconvenienced. And that's not a once a month thing. That's not a twice a month thing. That's not even a once a week thing. That is an everyday thing. That's why Jesus said in Luke 9 that if any man is going to come after me, he must take up his cross daily and follow me. Because the person who seeks to save his life is going to lose it. But the one who will lose his life for my name's sake will be saved. For what does it profit if a man gains the whole world and all the accolades and all the things and all the money and all the attention and all the fame but loses their own soul? Jesus went and paid the price at the cross so that his body could be built upon a sure foundation. So that his body could have his blood that was shed flowing through it. The spotless, sinless blood of Jesus. And that's what God wants us to unify around is what his son did at the cross. Because there are people who need to hear this story. And you guys have a perfect opportunity this week before Easter, the way that Jesus set his eyes toward the cross with passion, you can realize that God is making you a missionary in your workplace, in your school, in your, in your uh, community. To be a light, it may be the thing that begins to bring people to truly know him. Are we willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of the body of Christ? And remember what he's done for us.